Well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of What You Can EQ. After last week's historical episode, we are back to business as usual. And that usual business is, of course, that What You Can EQ is a weekly video series in which we highlight some of the best titles Netflix has to offer, with recommendations broken down into three categories. New to Netflix, where we recommend a new release most worth checking out right away. What the f*** is this, where we delve into the obscure or overlooked titles buried in the annals of Netflix. And For Your Consideration, where the recommended titles tie into a timely, predetermined cinematic theme. And speaking of usual things, I'm your usual co-host, Jim Rohner. And I am his partner, Alex Rabinowitz. Mm -hmm. Speaking of partners, Alex, that makes a good segue into my recommendation for New to Netflix. Mm. My recommendation for section one is The Kids Are All Right, written and directed by Lisa Cholodenko, starring Annette Bening and Julian Moore as lesbian parents of two teenagers conceived through artificial insemination. The teens, played by Mia Wasikowska and Joss Hutcherson, want to try and bring their birth father, played by Mark Ruffalo, into their family life. Now, Alex, The Kids Are All Right is a film that Bill O'Reilly and Glenn Beck would absolutely hate <laughs> in the sense that it depicts uh, a quote-unquote modern family, lesbian parents, kids that are conceived through artificial insemination, going through this, the same struggles, squabbles, successes, um, and fights as a quote-unquote nuclear family. Shut up. Exactly, and that's what's so great about the movie is that it doesn't make it the point of focus yeah. that, that they're a lesbian couple. You mm -hmm. know, we've seen in the past with movies about homosexual relationships, uh, Brokeback Mountain comes to mind, the whole movie becomes about that. Yeah. And this is really, that's a part of it, yeah. but it's not what this movie is about. The Kids Are Right is very much just about the institution of marriage itself and how it has its own universal challenges and victories no matter where you're gonna go. Roger Ebert, I think, really greatly summed this film up by when he said that the relationship depicted on film is imperfect but stable. Just like, you know, I can't speak for anyone else out there, but that's just what my family like was like growing up. And they, the uh, actors in this movie do a great job yes. of portraying this natural, realistic feel. Yeah, the, the, the big three, Annette Bening, Julian Moore, and Mark Ruffalo, are all fantastic. They all bring something different to the film. I think Annette Bening kind of steals the show, but they're all really great. And I think their performance in The Kids Are All Right is really aided by Lisa Cholodenko's script, in which it doesn't rely on overdramatics and monologues and these huge arguments, but just these little intricacies and little subtleties and this very naturalistic dialogue that no matter whether you're familiar with these kind of relationships or not, you can see something on screen, I think, that you can relate to. You can see arguments or discussions on screen and think, this is something that has happened in my life. Mm -hmm. It's really universally relatable. Family and love is universal. Yes, Alex, everybody speaks in the language of love. My obscure pick for this week is I'm Not There, a complex rumination on the life of Bob Dylan told in six different parts. Written and directed by Todd Haynes, the film stars Kate Blanchett, Richard Gere, Christian Bale, Heath Ledger, Ben Was Shaw, and Marcus Carl Franklin, all as a different form of Bob Dylan. And Jim, what Todd Haynes and I'm Not There does so well is portray the life of Bob Dylan <laughs> in six different parts, yep. completely turning the idea of the biopic on its head. Yeah, it, it seems like it was such a simple idea to use six different actors to portray somebody who has gone through so many different iterations in his life. Mm -hmm. And yet it seems so simple, yet nobody had ever done it before. And now it's an idea that no one will ever do again because if somebody sees that, it's like, oh, it's just ripping off of I'm Not There. Exactly, but it's so trademark and so genius because when you think about it on like a psychological or a, a personal level, uh, you are not the same person you were five minutes ago. You're not the same person you were five years ago. So if we were gonna make a movie of your life, how would we be able to get w just one person and one story? I think who better than Todd Haynes to direct I'm Not There because uh, not only is he really appreciative of Bob Dylan's music, mm -hmm. but he also has shown in the past with Superstar, the Karen Carpenter story, that he can take that idea of a biopic and turn it on his head and do something entirely different with it. It's one movie, but it's six movies. Mm -hmm. And film buffs will really appreciate the different genres that he's working in. One, you know, one, one part of this movie is a mockumentary. Mm -hmm. One part's a Western. Yeah. Uh, one part is French New Wave. And credit Todd Haynes as a director because he takes this kind of wild idea that jumps back and forth between uh, timelines and different ideologies and really gets strong performances out of every single actor in every single iteration. Yeah, and they're not even all directly playing Dylan, you know, some of them are so far removed from Dylan. For example, Heath Ledger's character. Right. I have to read to you his, <laughs> his connection to Dylan. It's just too complicated. Okay. So 
Heath Ledger yes. is playing a character uh -huh. who is an actor yes. who is starring in a biopic yeah. based on the life of Jack Rollins, which is Christian Bale's character who is based directly on Dylan. Shut up. Not only are uh, fans of Bob Dylan really going to love this, but uh, he makes it accessible uh, for you know people who don't really know anything about Bob Dylan. Uh, just imagine you know, if somebody were to try and watch a movie about our lives shot with six different actors each. But speaking of ravenous fan bases, that's a great way to transition into our next segment mm. for your consideration. With last year's release of Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince, the Harry Potter film franchise officially became the most lucrative film franchise in history, surpassing James Bond, Lord of the Rings, and even What You Gonna Cue. This is thanks in no small part to the armies of dedicated Harry Potter fans who would rather cast a Vada Kedavra on ten muggles than see the film series end. Oh my, don't tell me you're one of those. Alex, it's not important whether I am or am not wearing underpants and printed with pictures of wands, broomsticks, and snitches, but what is important is that this weekend signals the beginning of the end of the Harry Potter film franchise with the release of Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 1. So in honor of what may be the most eclectic collection of British thespians ever assembled on film, mm. we are dedicating for your consideration to films featuring Harry Potter actors. Yay! Kevin Smith takes religion head on in this Armageddon fantasy comedy. Dogma, written and directed by Mr. Smith, stars Ben Affleck, Matt Damon, Salma Hayek, Linda Fiorentino, Chris Rock, Jason Lee, and our Harry Potter actor at hand, Alan Rickman. Hey! Are you serious? <laughs> Fiorentino plays Bethany Sloan, the last living descendant of Christ, who in order to prevent the impending apocalypse, must stop a couple of godforsaken angels from getting back into heaven. Kevin Smith knows how to write a movie, mm. knows how to write a comedy, and he doesn't hold back here. <laughs> uh, Dogma features an imaginative, sprawling story that's half raunchy road comedy and half uh, pontification on theology. Yeah, before Dogma came out, Smith was kind of criticized for you know style over substance. His films were hilarious, Clerks, Small Rats, and Chasing Amy, but there wasn't really much lurking below the surface. Mm -hmm. uh, so Dogma was really surprising in the sense that not only is it hilarious, it also says a lot, and it's a very deep movie. Yeah, and, but he's still operating in his view askew universe. <laughs> yeah. We talked about it with Clerks, and mm -hmm. it's back again. Jay and Silent Bob are <laughs> in this movie. Uh, Matt Damon, Ben Affleck, yep. Jason Lee. These are all of his repertory players, and he really knows how to write for their voices and write to their strengths. Yeah, not only does he know how to write for his established players, but the parts that he writes for the cameos and the guest appearances also work exceptionally well. Oh yeah, I mean, George Carlin and Alanis Morissette yeah. are in this movie in cameos and they are super memorable. Yeah. And then uh, our Harry Potter actor at hand, hey. Mr. Alan Rickman, yes. otherwise known as Professor Severus Snape. Yes, or Hans Gruber. Yep, he's <laughs> known for playing a villain, yep. a bad guy. Mm -hmm. And here he's Metatron, the voice of God, <laughs> and he still brings that sly, ironic wit, and it's just, Super funny and just great all around. But of course, Dogma, upon its initial release, received a lot of controversy and a lot of scorn. Yeah, uh, Kevin Smith received 300,000 pieces of hate mail. 300,000 pieces of hate mail? That really gives us something to strive to here. Yeah. So, well, role reversals. Alan Rickman playing a good guy. I'm going to go with a good guy that was playing a bad guy. Oh. In my recommendation of toys. The founder of Zevo Toys is dying, and rather than hand the company over to his juvenile son, Leslie, played by Robin Williams, he hands it over instead to his brother, a lieutenant army general played by my Harry Potter actor, Michael Gambon. Mm. The transition seems smooth at first until Leslie discovers that his uncle is manufacturing a line of war toys that seem to be aimed at preparing children for remote-controlled combat. Now, Alex, it is said that Toys was the movie that Barry Levinson wanted to make before he made any other film. So before Good Morning Vietnam, before Rain Man, before The Natural, Toys was the one that Barry Levinson really wanted to make. It really just shows uh, a lot of care has gone into the creation of this film, uh, which is kind of contradictory to how it was received. Yeah, its IMDb rating and its Rotten Tomato meter is very low. <laughs> yeah, I think it's 4.6 out of 10 stars and 27% respectively. Hmm. Uh, people kind of hate this movie. So, defend toys. Okay. 
I think that toys works on the level of being uh, kind of a mythology or a parable. Uh, this film is very weird, so it would never really exist in the, quote, real world, even in the real world of film. There's a lot of surrealist elements in toys. I mean, one thing that I think of is uh, Leslie's father's grave is not a tombstone in a cemetery, but a giant statue of a bubble-blowing elephant in the middle of a wheat field. Ah, and how is Professor Dumbledore? <laughs> yes. Michael Gambon plays a bad guy, but doesn't really play an evil bad guy. He plays kind of a complicated bad guy in which he has his own father issues as a lieutenant general. He's trying to live up to his four-star general father. Hmm. And so with that, and with just kind of the juvenile relationship that Robin Williams has, you have kind of see this as these two people who are in danger of losing something. Gambon's character has already lost his innocence, and Robin Williams, by losing this company, is kind of in danger of losing that. Mm. And it's kind of embodied, I think, at the end of the climax, where there's this gigantic toy battle between these really cold, hard-edged mechanical military toys and these very innocent, round, shapely, friendly toys. And it just, in that scene, I think, enhances this idea of, uh, you know, losing childhood innocence and losing something that we all have kind of forgotten about. Of course. Good versus evil, loss of innocence. Sounds like Harry Potter to me. Yes, full circle. And with that, we come to the end of What You Gonna Cue. Thanks again for watching, guys. You can always reach us by email, or you can reach us on our social media websites, Twitter, Facebook, or visit us on our website, whatyougonnacue.com. And while you're there, Alex, what can they do on whatyougonnacue.com? Oh, yes. Like many of you know, we are running a Netflix giveaway contest where we will pick one lucky winner this month to receive six months of Netflix for free. No money involved. Right. All you have to do is go to our website, click on any of the banners to sign up for our free Netflix one-month trial, Sign up for your trial, send us your email confirmation, and you will be entered to win. Shut up. And if you guys already have Netflix, then, you know, give it to a friend. Tell friends about it, tell your family about it. Get a prison pen pal just so you can tell them about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, a reminder for next week, we're not going to have an episode. We are going to be taking off for Thanksgiving. We'll be eating a lot of turkey and sleeping through a lot of football games, probably. What's football? We hope you do the same. And for iTunes subscribers and listeners, you know, take the time to give us a rating, review, the higher we get reviewed, the more up on the iTunes page we get, and the more people will be exposed to the joys of what you're going to cue. Yes. Well, that's it for us, folks. Remember, for next time, when this baby reaches 88 miles per hour, you're going to see some serious shit. Seriously, Jim, what's football? <laughs>